Hey, Norhan, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. How are you? Oh, good to see you. So can you, sh can you try sharing the screen so we can see if we can get your uh, slides? Sure, just a second. Um, How do I say your family name? Easa or Isa? Uh, Isa is good. <laughs> okay. Um, I think, let's see. Is that working? Um, it looks good that we see more than one slide. So uh, I think we see everything. Yeah, let me um go over to, um, what do you call it, the slideshow mode. Yeah, I think that, is that good? Oh yeah, that looks very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, should I keep it up or just wait until? <laughs> Yeah, let's. Uh, if if you don't mind, let's keep it up. If you want, if you want to stop sharing, uh, that's fine too. And then we'll we'll resume. You're going to be the first one. Yeah. Let's see if we have the second speaker. Maybe not yet. I sent him a reminder, but I'm, I'm sure he either just connected or it will connect very soon. Oh, okay, Ben is here. Hello, Ben. Ben. Oh, there you go. Can I call you Ben or should I call you Benedict? Uh, ben is fine also. Hi. <laughs> Hello. So how do I say your family name? Is Fauzebe or Correct. Yes, that's correct. Perfectly Very good. spelled. <laughs> okay. Do you wanna do you wanna try the um uh to try to sh sh share the screen to see sure. if you can? All right. Well then um Norhan, let's uh Yeah. Also, um, sure. Yeah, release and then see if we can get the second speaker. That's 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 good. This is the entire okay. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So because it is three o'clock, I mean, might as well just go ahead and get started. Mm -hmm. um, looking through the list of participants, we have um, 27 participants, and to my knowledge, this session is being recorded already. And uh, now there's Terrell, uh, and I'm just acknowledging the leadership of the uh, Workforce Development TAC. How are you? Good, so now we are at 30 participants and um, let's just uh, slowly, slowly get started. Um, wh what, it is uh, August 16th, it's a Tuesday, it's 3 p.m. Eastern, and this is basically the time when we normally have e-poster sessions. My name is Adrian German. I'm a member of the QEDC Workforce Development TAC, and I served as a chair of the TAC last year. So this year, the leadership is um, for the TAC, Terrell France, who just waved, is um, the vice chair. And then Charles Robinson from IBM Quantum is the chair. Whether he will make it or not, we don't know. But if he makes it, we will know. And um, what can I just uh, welcome everybody to this uh, session? Um, we have right now about 33 um, um, 
people in attendance. And let's just let's just uh, get started with the very first uh, speaker. Before uh, I uh, let me just share the screen very briefly, and say that this is the plan for today. Um, if you go online, you could get basically all the presentations that we had in the past. This is session number 15. So this has been going on for about two years. We started in uh, 2020 at about this time. At the time chair was um, John Candelaria from Stanford System X. And every time we had four presenters. Today we tried to do something different. I also wanna clarify that with four presenters, even though we originally planned for an hour, we would basically, um, it would, uh, I hope I'm sharing, right? So, yeah. no, and you can see the list of people? Yes. Yeah. Very good. So, um, although we um, we always had uh, and planned to last one hour, it actually took us 90 minutes. So today for the first time, we have only three presenters and uh, with the goal of ac actually get, getting 20 minutes, 15 plus five, 15 presentation, five minutes, uh, question and answers. Um, and also today we had the, uh, I guess, unfortunate uh, situation that the third presenter called me and he said he has a uh, traveling situation with a little bit of an emergency. So he probably won't be able to make it today, but he would like to reschedule. So that, that means that we have two presenters today. And the first presenter, unless, the, unless Namit uh, makes it, the first presenter is, as you can see over here, Norhan, Isa from Purdue Physics and Astronomy, a uh, member of the um, uh, Anna Banerjee Lab. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna ask her to please um, um, share the screen. And I'm just gonna say a few words about her. Um, so the title of her presentation, as you can see, is Towards Efficient Quantum Spin Simulations on NISC Devices. Uh, Norhan Isa will start her fourth year as a physics PhD student at Purdue University this year. She's working, as I said, in Professor Arnab Banerjee's group and has mainly been working on utilizing quantum computing for quantum simulations. Uh, we ask everybody um, a question, describe your research in terms that a high school senior could relate to. And she says her research focuses on exploring how well we can use quantum computing as a new tool to simulate different quantum systems and materials efficiently. Her research has been exploring different simulations methods in order to see how accurate the results could get. Norhan has had collaborations in the past with both IBM and the Los Alamos National Lab. She has interned uh, there before and would be thrilled to be able to intern again. So with this, please join me in welcoming her and let her start her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, so this is um, the talk that I'm going to begin with towards efficient quantum spin simulations on NIST devices. Um, and of course, these are all the great people that have helped me through this. Um, these are the main points of discussion that I will be going with. And yeah, I guess I might as well begin. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the motivation and the background basically to our work. So. Um, the main reason that we're uh, doing this in setting spin systems is, is that we want to look at magnetic molecules and systems that are modeled as finite side spin systems uh, as they demonstrate a lot of interesting quantum phenomena and can be used in um, future technologies. Um, and so one of the main techniques to um, probe the um, correlation functions and the dynamics of such magnetic systems is um, inelastic neutron scattering. Um, and so in such inelastic neutron scattering experiments to further understand like the results and the dynamics of our systems, one of the main measurements is that of the magnetic neutron cross or um, the intensity spectrum which is um, pretty much listed uh, here below. And um, what we wanted to look at is um, this uh, expression that is found within um, our magnetic neutron cross section, which represents the coefficients of the dynamical spin-spin correlation functions. So it's this um, uh, expectation value right here. Um, where we're getting the correlation between two spins at different times, one at a certain t and one at the initial point. Um, alpha and beta right here can be x, y, or z spins, and i and j are the indices for um, which spins you're looking at. Um, 
So we wanted to measure these coefficients on actual um, quantum hardware, specifically IBM quantum hardware. Um, and this is just further detailing, like in the case of a two spin half system, um, for every alpha beta, you have um, C11, 12, 21, 22, and then uh, the different combinations of your spins, basically. So we have 36 coefficients in total. Um, so there was prior work that also motivated our work, um, is specifically this paper right here, which uh, presented a methodology to measure these um, coefficients on um, IBM quantum hardware. Um, we were motivated, however, to uh, move uh, or to like add to it uh, because they um, had two main things that we wanted to work on. The first point was the fact that they only used Trotterization, which is a method for um, uh, for a time evolution simulation that we're going to further talk about. And uh, they also, um, in this paper, didn't implement with real um, quantum hardware, although we're not claiming that we're the only ones who have like implemented on real quantum hardware. That was just something that we wanted to do. Um, and so we extended their work in the following manner. We looked at uh, the methods of time evolution simulation going from trotterization to VFF um, uh, using different measurement methods. So indirect measurements to direct measurements. And we also wanted to use measurement error mitigation. Um, and so we now look at the uh, all of these details. Um, and the first uh, factor that we wanna look at is the, uh, or are the methods of time evolution simulation. So just a little um, tidbit that I want to get out of the way right here is um, the fact that according to the baker campbell hasdra formula in mathematics, we know that um, uh, the product of uh, e to the power of x uh, times e to the power of y would be equal to e to the power of z, where z right here, given that these are all operators, would be written out in this form. So if um, X and Y are commuting um, the terms, then all of these would be canceled out and you would be able to write this as e to the power of X plus Y. But say if you were to have a Hamiltonian um, that has, um, or that is a summation of non-commuting terms, um, then in that case, you wouldn't be able to like factor it out into just e to the power of X and e to the power of Y. But this is something that you need to do in order to be able to like find your actual quantum gates that represent such um, uh, such an operator. Um, so with trotterization to the first order, um, what is done basically is that you approximate your time evolution operator um, to the product of the individual terms. Um, and with each time step, you repeat that, uh, you repeat the sequence of gates that represent the time evolution operator. Um, in order to evolve in time. So your t over n right here, which is your delta t, um, you're incrementing by it. And uh, theoretically, the smaller that your delta t is, the more accurate and or the closer um, this is to the actual um, exponential that you begin with. There is a problem with this, however, um, the, and the problem is, is that uh, basically as you're evolving in time, um, your 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 circuit depth is growing, which uh, which you can see right here. Um, as you're going um, with time, you're basically repeating this uh, these sequence of gates several times, which means that of course you're going to have more noise. And this is just a little sneak peek to one of the polarization results that we got um, for the real part of this uh, coefficient right here. So you can see like basically because of that you're getting um, large decay in time pretty quickly. So from that, we wanted to understand, is there a way that we can time evolve um, and avoid this problem basically? So from that came um, uh, this uh, algorithm right here, um, which is variational fast forwarding or VFF. So VFF, it, it allows for long time, uh, long time simulations to be, to be performed at um, a constant circuit depth. Um, and we do that by finding a diagonalized um, onsets that, uh, re that is approximately equal to um, this initial trotter expansion that we would have. So um, to, to give a little bit more information, um, you begin with a certain Hamiltonian 
and um, you get the Trotter approximation for um, that time evolution operator. Um, but instead of just sticking to that, uh, as is the case with um, trotterization, you want to find this uh, diagonalized ansatz in the form of WD, W dagger, where W is your unitary of, eigen, uh, of eigenfunctions and D is your uh, values. Sorry, is there something? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you guys still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. For some reason, my computer is bringing uh, is showing me an issue. Let me make sure that. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, you come in very clearly. Okay, sorry, no, something popped up on my computer. I'll continue. Um, but yeah, I was saying that um, our uh, our goal right here is to get um, this onsets written in this form um, and. Uh, with these certain parameters that we want to optimize. And so that optimization process comes in the form of having a cost function written in terms of the fidelity between our onsets and um, the and when we minimize this cost function, this gives us pretty much the optimum parameters. Um, and so it's a gradient descent uh, optimization loop that we go through to minimize this cost function. And at the end, we finally reach this diagonalized onsets with the um, optimized parameters. And so just like the case of having, say, a diagonal matrix where you no longer need to like keep on multiplying matrices to each other um, and just need to like, say, raise um, the diagonal elements to a certain power. So it's the same here. Like you no longer need to um, have like the uh, gates, the, the sequence of gates repeated. You just need to scale your time by a certain factor in order to evolve in time. So that means that you now achieve constant circuit depth. And so this, if we look back at that one result we have, um, the red uh, line right here is what represents the VFF results. And we can see that it's pretty close to your exact results and you don't really see that decay um, come in so quick. So that was pretty much the first factor that we wanted to look at in order to understand like how can we get our results to become um, more accurate. The second, um, factor that we looked at was um, measurement methods. So um, the two measurement methods that we looked at were indirect versus direct measurements. Um, with indirect measurements, it's sort of the standard way of having um, and also having an ancilla qubit um, where there are, oper uh, there are controlled operations between the ancilla qubit and the system qubit, and then you take the measurement on the ancilla. While um, this paper right here presented a, a methodology to convert between indirect to direct measurements, um, and instead of like having those controlled operations, we now have um, mid circuit um, projective measurements um, between the two system qubits. So this is basically just a way to reduce the number of, of qubits that you use in order to take a certain measurement. So that was something that we wanted to look at. Along with um, the third factor, we wanted to look at measurement error mitigation. Um, so in measurement error mitigation, basically what you have is that you have your counts or the results basically in the noiseless ideal case, and then you have the counts in the noisy case. And this uh, inverse calibration matrix that you um, are able to reduce by training, um, by training it on hardware. And when you, uh, obtain this calibration matrix, um, you can use it as uh, uh, to get a filter basically um, in order to uh, get your uh, noisy counts closer to the ideal counts. So that was just an air mitigation technique that we use. So um, to now look at all of the results that we have, um, this is just basic, basically something that I want to mention is that these um, results are all for two spin half systems or dimer systems. And um, the Hamiltonian that we are looking at are, is the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. And we used IBM Hanoi in order to um, get these results. And um, the, we're measuring the real part of the CXX11 um, coefficient. And so again, these are uh, the trotterization versus VFF results. We can see that VFF is much more efficient um, that it's much more efficient than trotterization over time. 
Um, then we have indirect versus direct measurements. So these are both EFF results, but um, the red line is with direct measurements. The pink line is with um, indirect measurements. It's kind of hard to see the difference, but um, like if you look very closely, the direct measurements are a little better. And then uh, again, with uh, measurement error mitigation, um, you've got the blue line is um, just VFF, and then the red line represents the mitigated VFF results. So again, little enhancement, but um, we can overall say that the most um, uh, influential factor was um, changing from chartization to VFF. Um, but we can also say that overall, when applying all of these techniques together, the best results we were able to obtain were those of the VFF results with air mitigation with direct measurements. And so that's just showing that all of these techniques do, in fact, um, make a difference when you're um, make, make a great difference when you're getting these results. Um, and so those are the results that we have right now. Um, what we aim to work on, however, is to um, scale our results. So instead of just looking at um, two spin systems, we want to move to larger systems. Of course, we also wanna look further into more optimization air mitigation techniques. Um, we wanna look at more complex uh, models, more complex Hamiltonians, basically. And we want to start using these simulations to be able to compare them to actual experimental data um, and see how accurate we can. So um, by experimental data, in our case, for, uh, the sort of data that we would want to look at is um, inelastic neutron scattering data. Um, so this is an example of uh, dimer results that you can have. And this is actually um, an example of results that we got with um, with VFF measurements on actual IBM hardware, along with um, the exact results that we should expect. And yeah, we can see that um, so far there is, you know, great potential for these techniques in such situations. And yeah, these, uh, I would just like to acknowledge the help that I have um, had from all of these great people. From Purdue University, of course, I would like to thank my PI, uh, uh, Dr. Anna Energy. From IBM, I would like to greatly um, thank uh, Jeffrey Cohn, who has greatly helped me with this. And I'd also really like to give a special uh, thank you to um, Zoe Holmes from Los Alamos, who has helped me a lot um, with all this work. And yeah, um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. This was wonderful. So now I would like to invite everybody. Uh, to ask questions. You can ask them by just uh, speaking them out or typing them in the chat. Anybody, any, any, any kind of question. For example, have you already explained um, the criteria that you use to choose the qubits that you run the simulations on? Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, if we, for example, were to look at that, like this event right here. Um, basically with all IBM quantum devices, you can access the calibration um, sort of factors such as um, the readout measurement errors, the um, uh, C naught errors between different qubits T1 and T2 time. So um, when you look at those uh, sort of um, factors, you wanna try to find the best qubits um, in regards to those. Um, uh, it's a bit tricky because the calibration of um, the qubits uh, change quite frequently. So like if you're going to get um, a set of, of data, for example, you want to try to make sure that you're, you're getting it within a close time frame so that the calibration doesn't change too drastically. Um, but overall, these are all things that you want to take into account um, in order to make sure that you're using the best qubits um, for your measurements. Thank you. So anybody else? Maybe let me ask a question. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm, I'm quite familiar with this uh, VFF pr approach. 
Um, but maybe you can, uh, because uh, now I have a question more with respect to a different method which you could compare to, which would be um, variational time evolution of, um, so what, what you're essentially doing in VFF is, is that you are diagonalizing your time evolution operator, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you do this variationally on a quantum computer. But mm -hmm. this, of course, would mean that you perfectly, that you can perfectly uh, time translate any state, but typically you're not interested in in translating any state perfectly, but rather like for example the ground state or some excited state, for example. Mm -hmm. um, is there some kind? So, did you compare, for example, your method to methods that only try to time evolve uh, a certain state uh, with a fixed uh, depth in in uh, in circuit size? Yeah. So. Um... In VFF, so in variational fast forwarding, the uh, algorithm that we were using, that in fact is diagonalizing over the complete Hilbert space, basically. But there are other techniques where you don't need to um, diagonalize over the complete Hilbert space. Um, for example, like um, the people from Las Alamos, they have um, a fixed state VFF algorithm where they do like with. Uh, along with having the Hamiltonian as uh, initial input, you also have your um, initial state that you want to diagonalize over. Um, and so that is possible. I I don't really have, um, like I, that was a algorithm that I did use uh, a long time ago, but I don't really have current results that I could match up with the results that I have right now. Um, however, um, it, it, I think the problem with fixed state VFF um, that we did see was that in that case, you can't take the measurements for all of the correlation functions, for all of the coefficients of the correlation functions, sure. because um, they're not all within the same space. So that's why we opted for VFF, where um, it's over the complete Hilbert space, no problem with looking at um, any coefficient, basically. So that was the main reason why we went with VFF. Oh, yeah, sure. No, that's a very good reason, actually, because, of course, if you have such a correlation function, you expect this to uh, do some excitation on top of the round state. And if you haven't optimized for that, then um, that would be bad. No, I, I completely understand. Okay, thank you. But, um, yeah, um, that's a great question. And, yeah, in general, like, for, uh, like, if you have some other purpose um, or that you don't need to diagonalize over the complete Hilbert space, there, there is an algorithm for that, basically, yeah. Okay, any other questions? If we, if we don't have any other questions, though maybe we can wait a few more seconds. We, we can move to the second speaker for the day. And uh, so thank you very much, Norhan. Thank you. And our second speaker for the day, and I think, uh, Ben, you can just share the screen now, is Dr. Benedikt Fauseve from um, uh, the German Aerospace Center Quantum Applications Group. Uh, just a few words. Uh, his title, as you can see, is, uh, well, Efficient Quantum Computation of Floquet Hamiltonians. The original title is basically Quantum Computing Floquet Band Structures, which is the same thing. So. <laughs> Uh, he's with the German Aerospace Center. Um, he has a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in theoretical physics from the Technical University of Dortmund in uh, Germany. He has been in his current position since April of 2022, and he has had previous appointments as a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Tokyo in Japan, at the Max Planck Institute for Solid State Research, and in the theoretical division at the Los Alamos National Lab in the U.S., um, he describes his research interest in as being in the digital quantum simulation applied to quantum materials. That means that he follows the original idea of Richard Feynman's uh, to investigate physical systems, for example, metals or insulators by using a universal quantum computer. Since uh, computers these days, quantum computers have um, problems like noise, high noise levels and gate imperfections, he develops new quantum algorithms that take these disadvantages into account to find new and exciting materials with promising applications such as superconductors and quantum uh, antiferromagnets. So with this, please join me in welcoming Benedict Fauzebe with the second presentation for the day. All right, thank you so much, uh, Adrian, for the very nice introduction. 
And yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Floquet Hamiltonians and how to compute uh, Floquet band structures with quantum computers. Uh, and this is work done in collaboration again with the Los Alamos National Laboratory. So very nice to see that uh, the uh, this Los Alamos is, is uh, really um, doing a lot of work in quantum computing. And of course, I was also there for, for two years as a postdoc. Uh, and this has worked uh, together with uh, Junus and Zoo. And we here really ask the question um, that if you want to compute um, for K Hamiltonians, this is in, in for classical computers actually a pretty hard problem, uh, especially if these systems that you want to look at are interacting. And we said, okay, what can we do there with a quantum computer? But let me start with a short introduction. I think uh, we've all now realized that uh, uh, the last century was uh, the dawn of the digital age. And in this uh, century, we now see uh, the dawn of the quantum age. So this uh, does not only include, of course, the recent advances in quantum computing, uh, but also, for example, in quantum materials and quantum sensing, uh, or also quantum cryptography. And in this talk, I'm trying to uh, combine the, the top two topics on quantum materials and quantum computing and try to show you how we can, for example, um, compute interesting uh, material properties in non-equilibrium non uh, using quantum computing techniques. Now, the motivation for this work mainly comes also from the recent advances in nonlinear optical spectroscopy for quantum materials. Uh, so here I've taken four different examples, uh, all of which I'm very interested in, and uh, which I also uh, studied using classical methods. Um, so for example, uh, there are these very famous Higgs oscillations that have been um, uncovered by the Shimano group in Tokyo which, uh, which uh, show that you can actually excite uh, order parameter oscillations of the superconducting condensate uh, using very strong terahertz pump pulses. Uh, then what you can also do in a superconductor is that you can induce superconductivity uh, even up to room temperature in uh, cuprates, alkali doped fullerides, and organic superconductors. Uh, this is work mainly done uh, by the Cavalieri group in, in um, uh, and on, on, on these, these material systems. Uh, then there's a, a recent work uh, by the group of Manfred Fiebig at the ETH in Zurich, uh, which so showed that uh, you can induce very interesting condostate dynamics uh, after a complete collapse, uh, after a pump pulse, uh, you actually see that there is a terahertz reflex after about uh, six to seven um, uh, picoseconds. And this is actually quite interesting because this is about uh, 100 times the typical time scale that we would expect for such a strongly correlated metal. And let me also quickly close this window. Ah, okay. Uh, this. Yes. Uh, and on the other hand, um, what you can also do now with light is that you can actually actively change uh, the topology of a material. So here, for example, um, it, this is work done at Stanford. They showed that you can, if you pump uh, the topological uh, material tungsten telluride, uh, you can actually show that this uh, goes through a phase transition, uh, which is actually a topological phase transition where um, the uh, central symmetry of the crystal is restored, and therefore the time resolved second harmonic uh, uh, second harmonic generation of a laser pulse um, is actually reduced uh, to zero. Now, all of these interesting phenomena uh, show us that you can really do exciting stuff in quantum materials, uh, especially in non-equilibrium, but uh, the problem is that these discoveries are mainly discoveries that were done by chance. Uh, so we still need theoretical guidance to actually find these very interesting phenomena, and this is the main problem for us theorists, that these systems are rather complicated already in equilibrium, and if you want to do non-equilibrium simulations with these, uh, you are very limited in the tool set that you can apply. And here, of course, the hope is that at some day, quantum computers can do this job for us and can really predict new and exciting phases um, that are currently not even, that we currently not even can think about uh, trying to simulate with classical computers. So here, uh, what we try to do here is really try to um, take the current limitations uh, of the quantum hardware that we have into account uh, and design new variational quantum algorithms. So of course, the main problem is that we have right now in these devices is that we have a very 
short uh, time until we hit uh, essentially the noise uh, wall of this device. Uh, and therefore, deep quantum circuits are right now not reachable for NIST devices. So instead, what we turn to are, um, are circuits that are parameterized by some parameters theta. And instead, what we do now, we make this uh, quantum circuit as, as shallow as possible. And then we optimize the parameters uh, given a, a certain uh, target function. So here in this example, I've taken the example of the variational quantum eigensolver. So here, for example, we say we want to we want to um, find a quantum state that minimizes, for example, the energy of a given Hamiltonian. And so what we do is uh, we combine the best of both worlds. We know that a quantum processor can very well represent quantum states, whereas a classical computer is very good at optimizing uh, the, uh, scalar functions, for example. And this is exactly what we do here now. We get the energy out of our quantum processor and then we optimize the energy and propose a new set of parameters that we then enter into this uh, quantum processor again. And uh, at some point, this loop will actually uh, converge, uh, hopefully, to, uh, uh, to, a, uh, to a state that is as close as possible to the ground state of a given Hamiltonian. Now, of course, this question pops up a whole new uh, set of new questions, uh, especially, especially what kind of parameterized circuit ansatzes do we actually use? Of course, IBM has made uh, an effort here and said, okay, what is the most hardware efficient ansatz for their uh, hardware? Um, there, But there are also under, other uh, ansatz uh, uh, equations that have more ansatz methods that have been used. Uh, for example, variational Hamiltonian ansatz, which was essentially based on this uh, trotterization idea year. Um, that does include the symmetries of the Hamiltonian, but uh, newer ansatz schemes are, for example, coming from optimal control inspired ideas, where you also have like an, um, where you have your, prob your problem Hamiltonian in your ansatz, but also additional driving terms that might not conserve the symmetries, but you might be more optimal in the sense that you quicker, that you find the ground state of your system more quickly. And the most important thing here, if we compare this, for example, to classical uh, approaches, is that these, all of these ansatz schemes you can actually show um, have an en enhanced expressiveness compared to, for example, a state of the art tensor network approaches. So here, the, the nice thing is really that we can show that if you have an arbitrary state in your uh, uh, Hibbert space, um, you can get closer to that space, to that state uh, by fewer parameters in such a quantum. Uh, variational ansatz than compared to, for example, a classical tensor network, Nets network ansatz like matrix product states. Now, our idea was I uh, wanted to compute uh, Floquet band structures. And to give you a quick reminder, what are actually these Floquet bands? Well, uh, we want to look at periodically driven systems. So, for example, by a laser pulse. Uh, and if you drive such a system with a laser pulse, you actually know that your Hamiltonian, uh, with a continuous laser pulse, of course, then you know that your Hamiltonian um, is time periodically. So, there's some time period t after which the Hamiltonian is again the same one. And if that is the case, then Floquet theorem tells us that the eigenstates of that Hamiltonian can be decomposed uh, into one part, which is the Floquet mode. On, on the other hand, a phase uh, which actually corresponds to the quasi Floquet energy uh, epsilon alpha that we have here on top. And most importantly, that Floquet mode is actually also periodic in time. Now, finding these Floquet eigenmodes is actually a classically hard problem, especially for interacting systems. And the idea is now uh, for our algorithm is that we use a time evolution, that we again use the time evolution operator uh, over a full period uh, so that if we apply, for example, this time evolution operator, then we know that we end up in the same state, but only with a certain phase epsilon alpha t uh, attached to it. Now, the basic idea uh, for all of these variational methods is, of course, that we're not dealing with the exact um, state, but rather we want to approximate that uh, Floquet mode on a quantum computer. So that's the, the general idea that we are applying here. But now the open question is, of course, how can we actually determine uh, the parameters of that variational quantum circuit? And that's where two of our algorithms set in. So we, we developed two kinds of algorithms that can determine uh, this u theta. And the first algorithm actually works in time domain. 
and it can very easily be represented in this graph over here on the right hand side. So we start with some parameterized quantum state, which is u theta times the computational basis state. And then what we do is we apply the time evolution to that state and we end up uh, after full time evolution ut with a new state which is given over here. And now, what is what is our like target function? Well, the target function is now the overlap between this initial state and uh, the time evolved state. And if that overlap is is uh, is at its maximum, so is one or is proportional to one, uh, then we know we are indeed uh, in an uh, Floquet eigen mode. And the nice thing is that this uh, overlap can actually be efficiently computed uh, using something that I call the zero state projector trick. So if you want to calculate such an, an uh, expect expectation value, uh, you can actually decompose that into a quantum mechanical expectation value where you only measure um, the, the way or where your observable is the zero state projector. Right, and then what we just do is we uh, we we uh, you choose some ansatz for our initial state. We optimize the parameters such that this target function function is actually maximized. Now, of course, we're not only interested in a single state, uh, but we also want to find even more states. And what we do then is that we just add like a Lagrange parameter uh, that um, includes the previous solutions, so the overlap with the previous solutions, uh, and therefore uh, we actually project out solutions that we've already found. Now, one open question is, of course, okay, with this we get the state, but what about the energy? Well, one approach that you can do now is, for example, uh, iterative quantum phase estimation to get really the uh, eigenenergy epsilon alpha out of that state. So you first optimize the state and then you just apply iterative quantum phase estimation to get the actual energy. Now, this is the algorithm that works in the time domain. We've also developed an algorithm that works in frequency domain. Uh, and here, the general idea is that uh, we use Fourier expansion of our Hamiltonian and also of our state uh, so that we actually um, like artificially extend the Hilbert space such that our state psi is now described by an, uh, by an intrinsic part and a part that is responsible for the, for the um, Fourier quantum number j. And then uh, again, we say, okay, in within that space, uh, we can um, now define a, a Floquet eigenstate, which is in this case, simply just the solution to this eigenvalue equation in the extended Hilbert space, where we have an effective Hamiltonian, which is the original Hamiltonian. So here, for example, this H naught. And on the other hand, we also have parts in the Hamiltonian that can uh, flip uh, the number of um, the, the, uh, the Floquet Okay, number, and we also have parts that actually measure in which of these planes am I actually situated. Now, what we just do uh, to calculate, for example, these um, Floquet eigenstates is that we calculate uh, the eigenstates of this effective Hamiltonian in the extended Hilbert space using, for example, variational quantum eigensolver. Uh, and again, we optimize then this, um, this, this uh, target function. In this case, we actually used uh, not the Hamiltonian itself, but rather the Hamiltonian squared. And the reason for that is that um, if you do such an expansion, you have to truncate uh, the Floquet number at some point, so this, this uh, uh, frequency number at some point, and then you know that the most accurate spectrum is actually in the middle um, of your bandwidth, and therefore we actually look at h squared and not h. And the quasi-energy then is also well defined by just taking the expectation value of that Hamiltonian again. Okay, so we developed these two algorithms and then we said, okay, uh, do they actually work? So we checked this with a, with a very simple system here, a linear driven spin one half system, uh, where uh, we choose, for example, for the algorithm one, uh, just a very uh, simple single qubit ansatz, uh, whereas for the algorithm two, uh, we need to take into account that we need this additional Floquet quantum number j. And here the undots is a little bit more complicated because what it does include now is not as on the one hand a qubit that accounts for the, um, the state psi and on the other hand a qdit with states minus one, zero and plus one um, that uh, is entangled with this qubit. And this is like an, an ansatz in this mixed qubit qdit state. 
Okay, so this and what we see here, of course, that this actually works very well. The only difference that you see to the exact curves over here is essentially that here we see some error that is just coming from the fact that we've limited the maximum number in frequency space to one or to plus minus and one. And uh, so this is just, of course, a, a numerical check, but what we are actually trying to do right now, together with the uh, uh, Mons group in Innsbruck, is they actually have, a they designed a universal cuded quantum processor based on trapped ions. Um, and right now we are trying to implement uh, the second algorithm. So this, uh, this algorithm that can actually use uh, or can make use of this cuded technology um, and trying to implement um, this algorithm on a real device to see how well this actually works in this mixed cuded qubit device. And uh, I'm sorry, going over time, I'm one minute over time, so uh, let me finish here. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or remarks, you can uh, send me an email. And let me also make some advertisement. We are actually hiring a lot of people. And uh, if you are interested in what we are doing, uh, and you might be interested in working for Germany, for example, for two or three years as a postdoc, please uh, send me an email and uh, we can definitely discuss that. Thank you so much. Wonderful. So now the floor is open for questions. Anybody? Um, will this presentation be available? I believe uh, so. So I think it is being recorded. So I'm not the host. Terrell would know more. Um, normally, SRI is uh, setting these oh. things up. OK. So you can also host. You can also send me an email. I can send you the slides if you want to. Okay, thank you, yes. Sure. <laughs> thank you very much. So any other questions? Have you explained why the variational quantum algorithms are an improvement over the numerical or analytical approaches for quantum simulations, for example? Yeah, this is really um, the, the main reason why we are so much interested in these, um, in these algorithms is this enhanced expressiveness, right? Um, so if you are working in the field of um, in, in describing the theory of these quantum materials, be it superconductors or antiferromagnets, um, you can either work, of course, with, with analytical tools. Um, they are, of course, very limited in scope, be it something like beta ansatz or whatever. Um, they are very much limited in scope. Then you have the more numerical tools, such as, uh, let's say, matrix product states. They work very well in 1D mm -hmm. and in equilibrium, but already in non-equilibrium, they are they are hard to control and they have problems with containing the uh, entanglement entropy in the ansatz. And then, of course, people now start to think about even bigger variational ansatz schemes, be it these tensor network approaches or being uh, in the last, uh, let's say, five years, these neural network quantum states really took off. Uh, and people started to, to um, try to use this machine learning approach to represent quantum states. But even these states are not as powerful as the variational states in principle that we could produce on these devices. So right now we are, of course, still limited by the noise on the device. But this is something that even if we could like produce, if we, even if we don't have fully error corrected uh, qubits, but we only have like 100 qubits that are not so noisy that I can run like, I don't know, maybe let's say 20 or 30 uh, circuit depths um, on that device without running into this noise wall, then these states could already uh, be much more powerful than what we currently have available with, with these variational approaches. And that's really the hope that we could get to. So right now we're maybe, we can go up to, I don't know, on real devices. We're right now working with, with something up to 12 qubits with some very cool tricks. But going beyond 12 qubits, for example, right now seems rather unfeasible. So with all our uh, presenters, we asked some questions uh, at the beginning and collect some information. And at the end of the list of things in the form that we send them is, what questions would you like to ask our industrial partners uh, in the QEDC? So uh, Benedict uh, says we're, and he mentioned this during his presentation, we're still looking for partners that like to test our quantum algorithms on real devices, especially if you are also interested in 
digital quantum simulation and or you have a queued platform available you mentioned um, alpine uh, and uh, faculty yes yes yeah. correct mm -hmm. um, now the same but just briefly to go back to the to norhan's presentation um i, I just want to mention her question and then also share this link with you in the chat um, on account that also Christopher Bishop just made it into the meeting. So uh, Norhan's question was, I would like to ask IBM and Los Alamos specifically what qualifications and qualities they look for the most amongst those people who apply for a job. What are some steps that I could take as a graduate student still that could increase my chances of joining their workforce? So this particular question, when we asked Benedict, he was very clear. This is a great place to work for German Aerospace Center and so on, and we are hiring. The, the link that I shared with respect to Norhan's question is to the office hours that uh, Christopher is uh, running. And the next session is on August 25th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, normally anybody, not just a presenter, writes an email message to office hours at quantumconsortium.org with a brief statement of purpose and what time would be the best for them. Christopher may, uh, Chris, I mean, Chris may say a few words about the office hours, but then the goal of Q QDC Workforce Stack is to find a mentor for you from IBM, from Los Alamos, from some, some other place. So here's a question uh, for Ben. Could you please comment on the overall state of ion trap quantum computing? Oof, the overall state, I might not be qualified for that as a theoretician, <laughs> to be honest, but, um... The, the way I see it is if you compare it, for example, to other technologies uh, right now in, in, in my, let's say, humble opinion, is that the advantage of the trapped ions is, of course, that they are not artificial qubits, but rather, let's say, pure in the sense that they are, these are just the exact eigenenergies of, of the ions that you have there. Uh, and you're, you're working with these, these uh, exactly these states. And um, so that's that's the nice thing. They also have some some uh, advantages when it comes, for example, to uh, read out. Uh, right now, uh, one of the biggest sources of errors we saw that in the previous talk uh, for the superconducting ones is the readout error, which is quite uh, large. Often, uh, this is much better on a on a trapped ion uh, platform. Then the disadvantages of the trapped ion platform, in my opinion, right now is one thing is of course that. On average, the clock time, so to say, is, is slower than compared to, to superconducting ones. And the other thing is about scalability, of course, um, because right now when you are addressed, so one of the ways to address trapped ions is that you're essentially looking at, um, at, at um, phonon modes of these ion chains, right? And you choose a certain phonon mode that is then coupling uh, to, for example, two specific um, two specific uh, ions, and therefore you're entangling these these um, these ions with each other. Now, this is of course a method that is that is based in in frequency, right? So you're addressing, for example, two qubit gates in frequency, and um, you know frequency space is limited, very much limited, uh, because it's just one dimensional, and uh, Trying to entangling qubits this way is is uh, is of course problematic when it comes to scalability. Going, for example, beyond I don't know 50 qubits, for example, um, there's already quite an, an issue with with going beyond that limit. There are of course uh, ways around that, and one uh, very famous group actually here in Germany in Hannover, which I'm also working together with, with is the group of uh, Professor Christian Osbekaus. And what they are doing, uh, they are using trapped ions, but they are moving the trapped ions around uh, with microwave pulses. And in this way, they are only like putting two ions together, close together, that they want to entangle. And then they do this. Um, then they have no problem with frequency crowding, frequency space crowding. They can just do this locally and then move the ions apart again. Um, and this is, for example, a very promising approach to get around this scalability issue in, in trapped ion platforms. Uh, but you see, there's a lot of development there. Um, it's just that um, I'm, I wouldn't uh, put my money on any technology to be the one in, in 10 years to go through. I have no idea which it will be, <laughs> but I'm curious to work with all of them. So that's the nice thing for me as a, as a, a researcher. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for this very comprehensive answer. It's overall, let me just thank you uh, for your presentation. And as, as, as I mentioned, we had three presenters, but one of them couldn't make it. But fortunately, 
We have a, uh, I'd like to give uh, William Sch uh, Sch Schwaderer a few um, minutes to make a brief announcement of, about a technology that he has developed that he might present in the future. Uh, am I, I'm live, yeah. Uh, uh, this is my first time here and I haven't understood much of it. So uh, there we have it. Uh, my name is Dave Schwader. I'm CEO of Shapeshift Ciphers and I have developed a data encryption technology that's evolutionary, does not involve mathematics. It uses deterministic chaos as its foundation, principles that are over 130 years old. We, even, we can neutralize quantum computing uh, uh, Shor's algorithm attacks because there is no periodicity to analyze. Everything is completely random. Uh, we, uh, we present unsolvable problems versus difficult to solve problems as uh, goes on with every, with every other type of encryption. We provide uh, Shannon perfect secrecy. Uh, we also provide maximum uh, Shannon information entropy as an example, 128 kilobyte file can appear as one of an instance of uh, the number of atoms in the universe raised to the 77,000th power. That's before we start blending in garbage to make it difficult to, uh, to attack. We're very high performance, 26.5 gigabytes per second, which is 500 times faster than what Google is happy with, with their Andy Anthem. We're doing that on an eight core laptop. Uh, we can trade performance for encryption strength. And uh, like other presenters, uh, we welcome your interest. You have my email. Uh, I, would, I would invite challenges. I would invite interest, uh, uh, any kind of testing that you want to do. Uh, this is something that's fundamentally different. Uh, you may not be comfortable with data encryption, but if you can add, subtract using two's complement, use the exclusive or operation to Boolean and and shuffle card. Uh, be able to shuffle cards, you are there. That's it. Okay, so uh, this particular session is in general uh, undergraduates, graduates, doctoral students, and postdocs. But since you said you are new, um, that was very meaningful. I have a feeling that there might be a place in the quantum marketplace where basically companies, because you are representing a company, they come and they present its uh, class, not classified, but categorized in hardware, software, and so on. So the, I, I will send you information. Um, and then there is also a comment, a question for you. Could you comment on hardware versus software approaches in quantum security? If, if well, you have to ask what kind of uh, 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 data data encryption uh, you would be using. I'm, I'm focusing on data encryption. Uh, the problem with mathematical foundations is, is that they can be cracked by mathematics. And uh, NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, had two finalist candidates for standardization. One got cracked in January, and then one got cracked two, week, two weeks ago. If and when the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the standards get cracked, uh, at, there's, there's going to be chaos in the market. Uh, we, we can benefit from hardware accelerators, but everything we do right now is pure software because we want to scale from IoT up to cloud, cloud-based systems. Uh, so uh, Kevin, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does pretty much. You know, we hear about the Samsung Galaxy quantum phones overseas. They claim they're the most secure phones in the planet. <clears throat> and then also you can have keys made, you know, software based on an ion trap computer, and you can incorporate into today's encryption. So that's basically the question. I, I, my guess is there's going to continue to be hardware-based solutions, right? There will be hardware-based solutions, but we don't use keys. We use arbitrarily long initialization vectors into a, a pseudo-random number generator complex that is computationally indistinguishable from pure random noise. Okay, and then you said your argument is basically it's 10 to the whatever times greater than the number of atoms on Earth? No, the 128 kilobyte file can be encrypted because we have unconstrained what we refer to as bit dispersion as the number of atoms in the observable universe raised to the 77,000th power. That's before we start blending in garbage to make it really difficult. 
Okay. And then is there a way currently to measure entropy or randomness, say if you want hardware approach, current day approach, and then like software quantum approach as well? Uh, there are, there are, um, there are random bit analysis routines that are out. Um, Die Harder 2, uh, Testo 2, Zero 2, things like that, that will go in and look at the, uh, 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 the bit distribution, not just the number of zeros versus the number of ones, but their patterns, whether they repeat and things like that. Uh, but it, 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 it basically gets to a point where if you're computationally indistinguishable from pure random, uh, then you're, you're basically there. Does, does that help? And you're saying you wouldn't need like a supercomputer to measure randomness. It's just assumed. Oh, you can do random. You, Bit Defender is out of, I believe, University North. Uh, no, Die Harder Two is out of uh, uh, University of North Carolina, and they have uh, this guy has a package. I don't remember his name, but he has a package you can download, and and it'll run it through like twenty different tests for uh, a quality of randomization. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. And this brings us pretty much um, to the top of the hour. So we're supposed to finish in about three minutes. If anybody else has any announcements, Terrell or Chris, this would be a time to do them, to make them. I have none. Thank you. Okay. Other, other than see you all next time. Yeah. Next time is going to be October 18. We'll send you an update. Thank you very much, David. I have your email. I'm going to send you information about the quantum marketplace. Um, and this concludes our session today. Thank you so much for attending. And like Terrell said, see you next time. Bye-bye. Adrian, nice job. You're on mute anyway. It was great. <laughs> yeah, I said thank you, and thanks for coming. Yeah, no, sorry, I was late. I had another call, but these are these are great sessions. So, so, so people can get uh, specific mentors if they ask, or not really. I haven't been doing that, but I'm getting more requests for specific kinds of connections. I've been mm -hmm. sort of enjoying putting people together who are in different fields because I think it makes for interesting conversations. But yeah, that's better. Who have been sort of returned students are asking. For more specific, so I'm I'm starting to you know, be sensitive to those requests and try to put people with people that are experts in the field they're studying or whatever. Yeah, no, I think a, a mentor is better than no mentor, and then of course with time, they can converge towards I don't know a different mentor. Yeah, so, thanks for all you do. Well, thank you, man. I think it's been it's been great. The, the the students are fantastic, and the mentors from QEDC who signed up are just you know, passionate about it as well. So it's been good. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Have a good All rest right. of the day. Bye-bye. Yeah, you too. Take care. Bye.